my name is Timothy Paulion. Welcome to another Newsmaker Live broadcast right here on DBS Television. We go up until 10 o'clock this evening, at which time we'll be concluding with the clip that peaked. Of course, it's quite relevant that we have our program tonight and the focus on the fact that Sinusha has been placed on a tropical storm watch. I have a special guest in studio who will be in a position to provide you with critical and credible information. First, we have a tropical weather outlook coming out of the Met Office as uh, um, the 6 p.m. weather report at 5 p.m. today. The center of a Tropical Storm Kirk was located near latitude 12.7 degrees north, longitude 55.7 degrees west or 367 miles or 590 kilometers east-southeast of St. Lucia. Kirk is moving toward the west-northwest near 18 miles per hour or 30 kilometers per hour. On this forecast track, the center will move over the Les Antilles within the tropical storm warning area Thursday afternoon. Maximum sustained winds have increased to near 60 miles per hour or 96 kilometers per hour with higher gusts. Tropical storm force winds extend outward up to 115 miles per hour from the center. Residents and interests in and around St. Lucia and the rest of the eastern Caribbean islands are strongly advised to continue monitoring the progress of Cook. On the broadcast this evening, my guest is the communications manager of the National Emergency Management Organization, Mr. Cohen Xavier. Thank you so much for appearing on the broadcast this, this evening. Thank you, team, and good evening to everybody in television land. There was a pre-strike meeting which took place earlier today. What came out of that exercise? Right. First of all, when you say pre-strike, we need to explain to people what pre-strike is. Mm -hmm. And even before we go that, I need to correct you that we're not under a watch, but actually a tropical storm warning. Warning, warning. okay. Right. A pre-strike meeting, really and truly, is an opportunity for all of the response agencies to come in together and for us to do what is called an inventory of resources in the country. So that if in case we are impacted, we know exactly the status of everything, whether they are prepared, what are their needs, are there any gaps, and then for us to fill those gaps as an organization, NEMO. So we had one of these, and that's part of our protocols whenever there is a warning. From the warning, and from the pre-strike meeting, at least two important decisions were made. The first important decision that was made is that schools are going to remain closed tomorrow, Thursday 27th, and Friday 28th. However, all the teachers and all the principals are to report to school, their, their respective schools, at 9 a.m. in the morning so that they could activate what is called a continuity of operations plan. That's the most important decision that was made today. The next important decision that was made is that right now the emergency operations center has been partially activated, level two. So it means that throughout the night, you have persons manning the office at Nemo's headquarters, monitoring every aspect of the storm. And that was a meeting of NEMAC? That was, well, yes, NEMAC. And that would consist of various agencies, various bodies? Right. In order for you to understand, maybe I should give you an overview of what NEMO is. Well, NEMO is a, is a very huge organization, and it has three tiers. The first tier, which is what you just spoke about, is called NEMAC, the National Emergency Management Authority Committee or Council. These are the decision makers. It comprise persons who have responsibility for resources in the country. So you have the PSs, you have executives from private sector organizations, you have other sister agencies like Red Cross, Police Chief Slasper. So everybody who has res direct responsibility for resources on the island, whether that be financial, whether that be human, or immovable assets that we, we could utilize in a response, they are part of NEMAC. So that's the decision-making body. The second tier is really and truly our committees. And that's where you have a lot of the professionals and the experts. And then you also have the district disaster committees, 
and then you have liaison officers. These committees, whether it's the national committees or the subcommittees or the district disaster committees, are made up of experts, professionals, public servants, persons from faith-based organization, volunteers. In, in fact, I would say in reality, all St. Lucians or all residents of St. Lucia are part of NEMO. So they fit in one of those three groups. And then you have the Secretariat. And what the Secretariat does, it links the decision makers with the persons who actually carry out the work on the ground. It also is a support agency for when, like today, you have the Emergency Operating Center being activated. So that's NEMO in a nutshell. Now, at today's meeting, um, I imagine it would have been drawn out. What is the duration of that meeting today? No, not at all. I, I think it was very, very, it was efficiently run. Mm -hmm. It's not drawn out. And in fact, when you, take in, when you have to take serious decisions, I would not call out drawn out. Well, I'm, just, I'm asking, basically, um, how much thought would have gone into the decision to decide not to have classes tomorrow and Friday? Because that is not a, a decision that one would reach, um, you know, um, quickly without much thought and discussion. Yes, and I agree with you. Well, the meeting was about two hours in, mm. in length, in duration. But the information came from, first of all, the, ex the weather experts. And under NEMO, our weather experts are the Met Office, who is headed by a director. And so he presented to us, based on the current information, because remember, weather is not something that you could predict. So it's always the information you have at hand at a particular time. So based on the information he had in his possession, and all of the modules which were run using Monte Carlo simulations and other modules, it was felt out of an abundance of precaution, especially for the lives of persons children and students being the most, well, one of the most vulnerable aspects of our community, that we should close schools so that they will, ne they will not be caught in any adverse weather. Because based on all the information we have, the scientific data that we could, we use for decision making, this storm, and you, and you just read how big it is, is supposed to start affecting us somewhere about midday. So you don't want whereby admit this thing is affecting us and school and to take them to safety. That in itself would be business places to go and look for their children and to safety. So you know about the possible impact of um, that storm tomorrow. Okay. Um, do we envisage that the impact will be so um, negative, so tremendous, that there's need to keep classes closed on Friday? Well, there are a number of issues here. First and foremost, you cannot really predict weather. That, you know, forecasting is not an exact science. As you notice, first and foremost, look at how Kirk has behaved. Just two days ago, it was downgraded. Less than 48 hours, it's back up to a tropical storm strength. According to the last forecast we saw, it went from about 45 now to about 60 miles. And there's even talk of it extending winds to about 70. The question is, where would you rather your children be? At home in the comfort of your safety or out facing that kind of danger? You know? So sometimes, you know, we have to ask ourselves which one is easy, which one is better, prevention or dealing with the aftermath. But do you think that Nemo sometimes and NEMAC would conduct those meetings and uh, having at the back of their minds what the members of the Senusian Society would say when they take a particular decision? Because they have heard it in the past that you did keep the children away from school on a particular day and it was sunny, the weather was fine. Why did you do that? Is it on the basis of... Uh, some um, misinformation on the basis of the weather situation that would have been at the disposal of the authorities at the time? 
Right. So remember, so let's just recap. Weather is unpredictable. At this minute, it could be 10 miles. In 30 seconds, it could move up to 100. So when you take decision, it is based on the information you have on the, at the time and also based on what is called data history. So when you take this, the data you have at the time, historical information, plus concern, because remember the first thing is for the protection of human lives. This is our number one priority at NEMO. Any life lost, right, is one life too many. And so think about it. On a Friday afternoon, you're in town and you see when school ends at 3 o'clock. You see what happens in town. Add to that the possibility of persons um, getting blown away by 70 hour mile per hour winds and flooding. And sometimes if you were to leave, in fact, we know we have some vulnerable areas in our community, the Bexar area, Bade, Bade Hill. Imagine if you have a situation that persons who come from the south of the island and from the east and the west cannot get back down to their dwellings. Do we have anywhere in cash trees to house all those children? How much of no. a challenge do you experience from time to time in terms of um, assessing the condition of the weather and providing reliable information to members of the public, um, considering that people have so many sources um, that they can access weather information? Right. Uh, we always ask persons and we advocate to persons that they always listen to the Met Office official information for the simple reason. We have all different types of information. But the Met Office, what they do is they contextualize the information. They analyze the information, you know, in respect to our conditions right here in St. Lucia. They also have historical data, and the Met Office is very good at that. In fact, they're one of the best institutions on island where they, could, they have kept for a number of years, maybe 75 years or so, data on every aspect of of weather, whether it is rainfall, whether it is droughts, whether it's hurricanes. So what they will do is they'll see something, they will take that and based on the information they have and their experience, then they will advise. It's the same way team, and let me let me put it let me make it more practical for you. You live at Hospital Road, right? There is a drain right next to your house. You know that if, it, if rain falls for half an hour, that this river is going to overflow its banks. Mm -hmm. You know that because you have the local knowledge, the indigenous knowledge about that river, which is right next to your house. Yeah? The people in the States don't know that, do they? They could tell you, okay, in order mm -hmm. to get water moving from, the engineers could tell you, in order to get water moving from one point to one point, it needs to be that wide. But in terms of the local context, they don't have that information. And that's the critical role that the Met Office plays. Now, people have been critical of the Met Office um, over the few years, last mm -hmm. few years, in terms of the interpretation of the weather. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that you've heard this complaint coming from certain sections of the public. And right. even up today, I think, right. got an email or two um, during the newspaper program on, on RCA. People are saying that there's need for further clarification as far as the weather news is concerned. And those issues normally come up around this time of the year. Correct. You know, in the, when we're facing um, mm -hmm. some, some severe weather. Well, I always believe every, th every good thing can be made better. So maybe if there's a need for us to go back to the drawing board and try to simplify maybe terms or maybe educate persons as to what terms mean, I say yes. Mm -hmm. But the, in reality, here's what happens. The director of the Met Services, and, I, and let's use Isaac for example, he came on and he said, look, St. Lucia is not under a watch or any alerts. However, because weather is so unpredictable and because of the size of this storm, we should still be vigilant. So he has advisors based on his experience, based on his expertise. And what did people do? They did not pay heed. They did not take the abundance of caution 
the advice given. And what happened? So what we did is, according, and that's what we're doing right now, we plan for this called worst case scenario, but we hope for the best. And it's up to our, our population to understand that, that you may plan, but it does not mean that your plans will help you. And they should be grateful, at least, the work that the people from the Met Office and all the other officials we have are doing just to try and keep us safe. And they should thank God that we have not had to deal with Ida or Maria, like Dominic and other people. And so they should just keep on being vigilant and play their part, because we all have responsibility and play their part in ensuring that we all remain safe when whether information is, is disseminated. For the benefit of people who are just joining us on DBS television and mm -hmm. also via um, our Facebook page, um, my guest this evening is Mr. Cohen Xavier, Communications Manager of the National Emergency Management Organization. Once again, St. Lucia has been placed on a tropical storm warning. Um, and again, let's just recap um, the outcome of today's pre-strike meeting. What would have been the, the, the main decisions taken? Right. So one of the main decisions taken is that school will remain closed tomorrow, Thursday, 27th September, as well as Friday, 28th September, because we are expecting that the storm is going to affect us from about midday on Thursday. And when, in fact, when the storm has passed us, we expect a lot of rain, heavy rain. And so that's why you have going into Friday, no school. But also, we need to understand that a lot of our schools currently serve as shelters, secondary shelters. So if in case God does not spare us and tropical storm could does come through, there's a, there might be a possibility that we might have to open some of those shelters so you can have school. So you see, decisions are not made in isolation. There are lots of other factors that go into making decisions. Some of it, public is not privy to, but what they need to do is to play their part. And their part is once instructions are given, they follow it. But should we make that mandatory? Because ever so often we've heard, for example, of instances where the authorities would ask people in low-lying areas mm -hmm. and communities that are prone to flooding, let's say Ancillary, Soufre, and Denry, and those people do not heed those warnings. And over several years now, we've been calling and clamoring for the authorities to enact the proper legislation to make those calls mandatory, your evacuation and so on. Mandatory will always help you because it means that you have the legal authority to go in and do that. But however, I, we always believe that people need to show responsibility and exercise common sense. If somebody is saying to you, do not drink Gramazone because it's going to kill you. Or do not play with other drugs because it's going to kill you. Are you going to be against them for trying to save your life? So these are some of the questions. But, but that if you're out of control, <laughs> <laughs> um, if, if um, reality is, mm -hmm. is not something that um, you identify with, as, as, as we know the evidence, right? right. People in just ground zone all the time. People commit suicide, mm. people overindulge in what alcoholic beverages and so on. Yeah. So th that's the reality of life. So maybe sometimes we have to try to save the people against themselves by enacting legislation. I don't know in this particular case why, um, if it is necessary um, to have proper legislation enacted so that you could make the evacuation mandatory, uh, legislated. Yeah, as I say to the you, case legislation will always help. <coughs> mm. Will always help. Will certainly help in, in this case. And I'm saying to persons, we prefer to get persons to act responsibly than having to force them. Because the other issue you have is when you try and force persons, people tell you it's my choice, you know. But they don't look at the other side. But in when the, you in, yes, in end down the, the, the emergency services personnel would have to venture exactly. Out. Mm -hmm. So they don't see the other side. When you disobey or disregard good advice that has been given to you. You're actually not only putting yourself in danger, but the lives of the emergency person who has to now leave the comfort 
both of the station or their house and their families to come and look for you. You know, so I think we need to play our parts as citizens. First of all, recognize that we have a responsibility, first and foremost, for our own protection, the protections of our lives and our property. And it's for this reason we need to heed the call and we need to heed the instructions and the, the advice given by the authorities. Considering expecting a lot of rain to be associated with um, this weather system, mm -hmm. um, how much consideration was given to low-lying communities and low-lying areas? In particular, um, the obvious communities, the ancillary, canneries, um, Soufre, Denary. Consideration is always given. And as I keep, and I have said to you before, persons know the local, their local environment better than the authorities. So I might say to you that we're expecting flood, but you will know, especially if you have been living in an area for a number of years, how much rain it takes in order to flood that place. Now don't tell me. So you have lived in an area for 30 years, and you know that if rain falls for one hour, it's going to rise and come into your house. You're going to wait until somebody tells you that you need to get out. See, but that's the, and that's the responsibility we need to share. But in terms of those low-lying areas, I could tell you, and coming from the NIMAC meeting, the pre-strike meeting we had, agencies with responsibility for, for things like drainage, they have reported that they have done everything necessary to mitigate the flooding in some of those areas. Because some, sometimes you cannot prevent, but you could lessen, you can mitigate the impact. Now, if you have taken such a decision on the part of uh, students mm -hmm. in St. Lucia, what about employees? I'm sure the people who are watching this broadcast mm -hmm. tonight and listening would say, um, should employees be venturing out to work tomorrow? Right. So let us put that into, let's put that into context. As part of NEMO, you have the Chamber of Commerce, and they were represented today by, by Mr. Brian Luisi. What we have tried to do as part of preparation is to get every business place to develop what is called a business continuity plan. And what a business continuity plan would do, it will first of all assess your risk for the different hazards. And also what it will do, it will take those risks and then it will put them into phases. So you break it down, so prior to when a warning is issued, during and maybe after what should happen. All of these businesses, according to the Chamber of Commerce, they have their own business continuity plan and based on the protocols, they will enact that when the time is right because they have the internal protocols. What we do is we give them the information we advise them, but it's left up to them to activate based on the plans which they have made prior to. But what, there are instances where, for example, the authorities would um, issue a notice and ask uh, the members of the public to stay, from, stay away from work. And yet still some business establishments, it happened uh, a few years ago, mm -hmm. would open their doors. And certainly that would put the lives of the employees at risk. Not quite. The reason I not say what that... Is, what is not quite? <coughs> because, you see, in St. Lucia, the businesses are categorized. You have what is called... Um, there are some businesses that we categorize su supermarkets, hardware stores, um, petrol stations. They are categorized in this instant when it comes to emergencies as essential services. And usually essential services are the, l the last persons to close. So their business continuity plan will take into consideration how much time they need mm -hmm. in order to get their employees home safely. So what you maybe see as a, as a, as a hazard is actually might be part of the business operations plan, which they have done all the internal arrangements. Because what they will do is, if they have 10 employees, they might send them out home in phases. Mm -hmm. So... Really and truly, you might see them open, but that might be because that's part of their business continuity plan. 
You're watching News Mega Live right here on DBS Television with me, Timothy Polion, and my guest, Mr. Cohen Xavier, Communications Manager of the National Emergency Management Organization. We'll continue our discussion in just a moment, and of course, later, take your calls. Stay with us. Thank you so much for staying with us. You're watching Newsmaker Live right here on DBS Television with me, Timothy Polia, and my guest once again is Mr. Cohen Xavier, Communications Manager at the National Emergency Management Office. St. Lucia being placed on a tropical storm warning, so basically we're just providing you with critical information. Uh, that would include the fact that we should be feeling the effects of the, the tropical storm by midday tomorrow, but the real impact of that storm later in the evening so continue um, to monitor the various radio stations monitor dbs television will provide you the latest information so that you could be prepared for that storm disaster dis um, disaster committees district disaster committees how active are they mr zabi they are active but although we'll prefer if they were a little more active mm. but they are actually active because what has happened from the time we've been monitoring Cook or any, or any approaching storm, according to the protocol, depending whether it's a watch, a warning, you will put all these committees on standby. For example, do we have an active disaster um, committee in Castro Central? Because I know at one time there was a very active committee in place to resent Mr. Christopher Paul. I don't know if it is still in existence. Mr. Christopher Paul is still the chairperson of okay. that committee. How mm -hmm. active they are, I cannot tell you. Okay. But I could say to you, that according to our protocols, and in case of this tropical storm, we have already alerted all the distri district disaster committees. In fact, at this pre-strike meeting, we had some of them represented. So I could tell you, Grosile was there, Castries North was there, Castries South East was there, and the others, they were having, like this morning, I am I'm aware that Babuno, they had a, co a committee meeting. And that's what will have been happening throughout the day and at different times. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, issues relating to, do we take in consideration to the protection of animals when you have those meetings? Well, animals basically right now are the owner's responsibility. Mm -hmm. And we always advise, and we have been doing that for years. From the time I was a child, I used to see Timothy James and other persons tell you that in terms of, of weather systems, it's best that you, you, un, you untie animals and let them free so that if in case flooding comes, that they don't drown. So that is still standard protocol. We also ask our, our residents to treat animals as if they're part of their own family or their own household. And so persons actually, in fact, I would tell you that sometimes people treat the animals better than human beings. Mm -hmm. So in that way, we encourage persons to actually to think about the animals and especially their pets. Okay. Looking at the essential services, let's look at Wasco and, and Lucy Lake. They would be part of that meeting today as well? Oh, they are. Mm -hmm. Remember, as, as I said to you, NEMO is a very huge organization. Nearly every organization in this country is part of NEMO. Um, it's also made up of faith-based organizations, voluntary organizations. The Red Cross is part of it, St. John's Ambulance, private sector, and, of course, every resident of this country. Specifically, what's the situation with WASCO, if you know what came out of right. that NEMAC meeting involving that um, fact, utility company? According to WASCO, <laughs> WASCO is prepared. And I know, from, I know that very early o'clock because I... I spoke with the communications person from very early. Mm -hmm. That might have been one of the first calls, Miss Sherry Ann Gillard Williams. Gillard Williams. Mm -hmm. And she was, she's always proactive. <coughs> and I know that this morning she was going to encourage them to have a pre-strike meeting in order to come to our meeting. And they were represented at. In fact, what they informed us that they're doing, they say they're preparing. And what they will be doing is actually start to shut down some of the intakes, especially in the south. Intakes that are <laughs> So they are doing 
a long So last one is in the fact even full before today, this gilad is always on the balls because you can As I said to you, the business sector is Well, the business sector is represented by um, the Chamber, the chamber right. of Commerce. Mm -hmm. So the representative was there, and I could tell you throughout the meeting, he was receiving calls and he was passing on information to, to his members. So I know too that they would be actually activating right now the business continuity plans. What that is, I can to directly. I can't say what it is, but they all know what it is. All they'll be doing right now, since we have given, we have advised them. Based on the advice given, they would have been, they will actually presently activate those business continuity plans. What about the whole hotel sector? Because they have uh, many hotels that are operating very close to the seas. Correct. The hotels too. From the time, in fact, they open their businesses, they have emergency plans. And they're part of the St. Lucia Hotel and Tourism Association. Also, you had the Ministry of Tourism. Remember, I tell you, everybody or every organization that's an organization, would you have note, is part of NEMO. So everybody in St. Lucia is part of NEMO. What you have is just have various sectors of various um, organizations. They come together. They help out their members. But certainly, the tourist sector is on board. Even Slasper mm -hmm. reported. The Slasper reported to us. The Ministry of Health reported to us. They, in fact, they're in a, they're in a very a good state of of readiness. Apart from the Saint Jude's Hospital, but even there too, they have a plan for that eventuality. Should they have to relocate, they have a plan in place for that kind of. And the NIMAC meeting, who headed that meeting today? Right. Today, the meeting was chaired by the Cabinet Secretary, mm -hmm. who is the Deputy Chair of NIMAC. The, um, the, ch the chairperson is actually the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister is out of state, so you have the Acting Prime Minister, who is Mr. Ezekiel Joseph, who was actually attending to other pressing matters. And so, the Deputy Chair of NIMAC chaired the meeting. What we'll do right now is to open the lines to take your calls. We'd love to hear from you. Maybe you have um, certain questions for Mr. Cohen Xavier, Communications Manager at uh, NEMO. Um, classes have been closed. They will not be reopening tomorrow and also on Friday. And we got that information earlier on from Mr. Cohen Xavier. Um, but the business community will continue to operate. Persons asked to report uh, for to work tomorrow. And uh, teachers as well, they are asked to report to Correct. work um, tomorrow as well. As much as the students will be um, kept away from the classroom, the teachers and the principals are asked to report to work tomorrow and also on Friday. So we'll put a telephone number on screen. We have already done that. In case you have a question for Mr. Cohen Xavier, you need further clarification on a particular subject matter, you can do so right now. And he's once again the communications manager of NEMO. I will say a very good evening to you watching this broadcast right now and also following us via our Facebook page. You're watching Newsmaker Live on DBS Television. With regard to the operations of, of NEMO, um, at what stage do you think that they will also need the if that is necessary?
calls coming in. So this will be helping me facilitate uh, those contributors um, to the program because I'm sure that you'd have some. Do we have a call? Okay, we've lost that call. But continue to call us once again. You are watching Newsmaker Live, a special edition with my guest, Mr. Cohen Xavier, Communications Manager of the National Emergency Management Organization. As we speak tonight, what are the tips you have for people in terms of preparing for the eventuality of um, that storm? Well, now that we are actually in the warning phase, it is now time for the persons to activate the the plans which they created, the family disaster plans. Mm -hmm. But more pointedly, right now, what they should be concentrating on is actually going through their supplies, ensuring that they have supplies to last at least five days for if in case something happened, and stocking up on perishable items. This evening into tomorrow, they should be actually turning up their refrigerators to the coldest setting. So if in case we lost power, at least the food could last much longer. Also, they should be doing some minor checks around the house, ensuring that branches are trimmed away from the house or pruned. So these are the things that they should be doing, um, fueling up their vehicles, ensuring that all the plans that they made prior to, they could activate it now, just like the business places. Because business places made plans, now it's time to implement those plans and see how they how they assist us, you know, to mitigate the impacts of this system. Now, a colleague was saying earlier, to, um, saying to me earlier today that she will not be venturing to the supermarket to buy non-perishable items because she had like, an experience where um, several years ago she bought um, perishable items, uh, non-perishable items, sorry, in abundance, <laughs> and the hurricane destroyed all those <laughs> items. So basically, she will keep her money in her purse. What say you to that? Well, you notice. Well, first of and foremost. You notice what I said. Have non-perishable items to last you at least five days. Five days cannot be in abundance. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, I al we always ask persons to exercise common sense. No, you don't. And I I in fact, what should happen is prior to any season, in fact, I rather say they should be perpetually prepared. So what you need to do is you, as you buy groceries for yourself so every week or every two weeks as you go to the to the grocery store just buy one item at a time so when you get to a stage like now you don't have to go rushing looking for money sometimes you don't have or buying in bulk so if every so if you shop monthly so this month you buy two cans of sardines the next month you buy two cans of milk the, the following month you buy two cans of, of corned beef it adds up to what is called your emergency supply stock. And in fact, on Nemo on our website, we have a checklist yeah. actually dividing your emergency stock exactly like on a weekly basis or a monthly basis. So persons are welcome to go on to there and to use that. How concerned are you about price gouging in, during the passage of a storm or in the build up to a storm, preparation for a storm? Because of the way we operate and the environment we operate, and based on some of the information we have, there is really no need for price gouging because from the information we have, there's sufficient food items on island that will not run out. It's just that people just panic and then they, you know. Also, based on some of the items, a lot of the items in the food basket and under the vat, regime you know there are a lot of items that are exempted and a lot of items where the markup on the item is fixed by government so if you go to the supermarkets there should not be any price gouging maybe if you go to non-controlled sector you mm -hmm. know tea boutique that might happen but i don't see massey and in fact here we have mostly massey and who else TJs, mm -hmm. those people are well regulated and I don't think they engage into. We have a caller nine. Yeah. Good right. evening. This is Newsmaker Live. You're on the air. Hello, good night. How are you guys doing? I'm okay. Good evening to you. How are you? I'm fine. Mm. Um, I heard a term being used sometime recently throughout the week there and I'm not too sure if I've ever heard this term before. So I wanted an explanation on it because we all know the stages of. A weather system, tropical wave, tropical depression, storm, hurricane, etc., and the categories. But I heard the term remnants of tropical storm cook being used. 
And I'm wondering, is that a stage between tropical depression and the storm? I've just never heard it before. So I just want some clarification on that term. Remnants, please. Okay. Mr. Xavier is not the director of med services, but I'm sure he will, he will <laughs> okay, help clarify. Okay, certainly. I will try to help mm. clarify. Remnant really means the end or the tail end of anything. So when you're talking about the remnants, it means that the threat dissipated. So let's, let's, let's track back. When we first heard about Kirk, we heard that it first first a depression, and then it became a tropical storm. Then we heard that it was um, downgraded, back to a depression so then that means kirk was no longer a kirk because you only get a name if you have become at least a tropical storm that's how that's how people get names before that they put it at is a number nine or something like that but it's only you only get an official name when you have become a tropical storm for you to become a tropical storm, you must have sustained winds of at least 39 miles per hour. So once, once whatever it is, the tropical cyclone, which we'll call it, reaches 39 miles per hour and higher, then it is given a name based on the alphabetical names that, that, that they have before the season. So in terms of Kirk itself, let us... It has had at least three lives because mm -hmm. it started off as a depression. It went up into a storm. That means it reached 39 miles per hour and then it was downgraded. What, you have, what we have happening again, that's why we say that weather, you cannot really predict weather. It regenerated itself based on circumstances and environmental factors. And so then it became cook again. So I don't know if that, they, I'm not a MET person, but maybe somebody from the MET office could call, could call and clarify. But from my layman's terms, mm -hmm. that is my, what I could do. And I think you tried your best. Yes, <laughs> I, I certainly tried. We continue to take your calls. If you have any concerns, if you want to communicate um, mm -hmm. to the authorities via this medium, it's a good time um, to call us. Um, what is your state and of, of preparedness and readiness okay. mm -hmm. um, for this um, tropical storm? We have been placed on a tropical storm warning, and we should be feeling the effects sometime tomorrow midday. Another caller line. Good evening. This is Newsmaker Live. You're on the air. Hello. Hi. Good evening to you, ma'am. You're on the air. I want to ask a question. Um, uh, concerning Lage, in case of an emergency, where is the shelter? Which, which shelter we have at Lage? This Lage where? In which community? Lage Babono. Lage Babono. Okay. okay, thank you so much. Okay, if you just give me okay, what um, Kowin will do, Kowin will try to I'll just get um, the go shelters, through the, yeah. the shelter because I yeah. remember it was just maybe about two months ago. Yes, I did send that, that out. Nemo did I send, send out that the information, I and out um, I went through right, the right all the, the the various shelters Perhaps around the island. I Dozens did. of shelters in the various communities. Okay, no um, in problem. Submission. I certainly. I think Kowin, you have the information now. I do. Let mm. me just pop into this one file here. And yes, so Lage, that's in Babono. Okay, so in the Babono, okay, Lage, the Lage Combined School is the designated shelter. So, so the Lage Combined School? The Lage Combined School. I don't know where that is, but that's the designated shelter, emergency shelter for Lage. Okay. You have a call. Good evening. Good evening, team. Hi, good evening to you, ma'am. Hello, good evening, team. Good evening to you. Um, is Nemo part of a shelter area too? Because we live next to Nemo. Oh, with we'll Nemo? Because, so the because when this mm. thing is happening, it's so hard to go down to the conferences. So <laughs> mm. <laughs> well, I okay, Mrs. Avi will respond right. to you. Thank so you so much. So mm. I thank you very much for that Obviously question. Obviously, she's calling from the BZ area. She's calling from the BZ yeah. area. In mm. the BZ area, that which is Cashries North, you have actually several shelters lots of shelters the nemo i i don't think we might turn somebody down but really and truly nemo is going to be the emergency operation operation center and so we would prefer we advise persons to use the designated shelters within the areas for the and the, the shelters will be okay there's uh, the several cash comprehensive secondary school right you have several shelter. okay so let me just run you have a call down, producer do you have a call 
Okay. okay. All right. All right. Sorry. So let's go to that call. Good evening. Thanks for holding on. You're on the air. Uh, hello. Good evening. Hi. Good, good evening. evening to you, ma'am. Um, my question is not dealing with shelter. Mm -hmm. However, what I would like to find out is this. Um, there is no weather station in St. Lucia. Nemo uh, is Nemo in agreement with NTN. That way we can at least get weather forecasting on a daily basis. For instance, every time I want to see weather, I have to go to Carla or I have to go to some other... Well, you go to, you go to, there's a website of the med service. That's anyway, right. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> now, some other website. Mm -hmm. But what I want to know is I want to get it from St. Lucia. Because um, many a times, when you see it on color sometimes, um, you see that those persons are not really focusing on dealing with St. Lucia Correct. in particular. Mm -hmm. They deal with probably the region. And sometimes you can actually see uh, something coming and th their backs are towards it. You, un you understand what I'm saying? I get your point, yeah. And, and you, you tend to say, say to yourself, but there's something coming and they're not showing it to us. So I'm wondering whether Nemo and NTN can come together and have that probably a, 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 a part of it, part of them, where they can give us the weather forecasting, you know, on a daily basis for St. Lucia. Okay, well, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, ma'am for this suggestion but what i will say to you is currently the met office puts out daily at least a minimum of four times a day a weather bulletin specifically for st lucia so you have a 6 a.m weather bulletin you have a midday weather bulletin you have sometimes a 2 p.m and then you have a 6 p.m weather bulletin and all and i must tell you the local stations, they are doing a fantastic job by relaying. So if you well, start... Point, my apologies, we have a call. Good evening, Newsmaker Live, you on the air? Yes, sir. Good evening to you, I have a simple question. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why is it um, shelters open after the storm and not before the storm? So somebody which house, I mean, whose house is not too good can go to a shelter and not after the storm when, I mean, shelters... Okay, thanks a lot. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right. That's that's a very good question and there's a simple answer to that. In St. Lucia, what we have is called secondary shelters. They are not meant because most of them are school and not meant to house persons during an incident or a hazard. Mm -hmm. And it is for this reason we say to persons that they must engage family members and the community in their emergency plans. So if you are aware because you know where you live, the conditions of your house, and it is not fitting or you do not believe it could weather the storm. The onus is on you to make, make the necessary arrangements to spend the time or to weather the storm with a family member, a friend, or a place where you think that, is, that you will be safe from the elements. And that's the reason. Also, this is something that we need to be cognizant of. In our context, our shelters, we do not have any shelters dedicated. That, that means that all they do is just house persons mm -hmm. in case of an emergency. All of our shelters are either churches or schools or other business places. So you see the issue. Sometimes so they have dual purposes. They have dual mm -hmm. purposes. And mm -hmm. so sometimes they might not be available to house persons before. So that's the other the issue to which um, we have been... Um, focusing on over the last um, few years would be the suitability of shelters that has come into question how suitable are those shelters when you say suitable right. what do you in, mean in in terms of them be being able to withstand the storm floods and so on the, st the structural integrity well first of all before uh, any building is designated as a shelter the experts go on and inspect them for nemo the experts for dealing with infrastructural works and infrastructure and buildings and for shelters is the Ministry of Infrastructure. And the staff from the ministry, every, they go through every year, they inspect every single building before they send it to us and say, yes, we have passed this as a shelter. Also, you have different types of shelters because you might have, for instance, one building, a school being used 
just to house somebody if there is a flood, but they have some shelters that cannot be used or schools that cannot be used for that particular type of shelter mm -hmm. because they themselves are in a flood plain. But as I say to you, the Ministry of Infrastructure on a yearly basis, they go through all the buildings that we put out as emergency shelters. They pass them and they say it is fit for use for a particular type of hazard. Um, let's go through the, again some of the shelters. I think you're right. about to do that um, in a particular constituency. That'll be well, Castries North. Castries North. Mm -hmm. So Castries North, we begin with Le Clary. So the Le Clary Roman Catholic Church, the Ville Cultural Club, Clubhouse, the Maranatha Seventh-day Adventist Church. In Ville you have the Ville Combined School, the Ville Secondary School, the Sir Ira Simon Secondary School. In Mondido, you have the Mondidor Combined School. So these are some shelters in Castries North. In Castries Central, since we're dealing with Castries, mm -hmm. you know, I'll just take the opportunity. You have the Camille Henry Memorial School, the Camille Rennie Memorial School, the St. Aloysius R.O.C. Boys Primary School, St. Aloysius Roman Catholic Boys Infant School, the Ave Maria Girls Infant School, the Ave Maria Girls Primary School, the Anglican Infant School, the Canon Laurie Primary School, Holy T. Trinity Anglican Church, Castries Seventh day Adventist Church, Castries City Hall, Castries Methodist Church, Salvation Army Church. But it's important for persons to know, to note that you don't just go to a shelter. The shelter must first be open. In fact, first of all, you must have a shelter manager there to ensure that it is ready to receive you. And and to make sure that you there's some level of comfort. Mm -hmm. So that's why you do not just pick up yourself and go to a shelter. You must first wait until you advise that the shelter is open. In some instances, which has happened, um, things are real rough. And then the director of NEMO would take a decision to open a particular shelter to alleviate the issue, the problems. But you should never just go to a shelter. You must always wait until... And you'll be informed or advised. You'll be informed via the media mm -hmm. which shelters are open and where. Plus also, you're forgetting that we, that's why you have the district disaster committees in place. They are the ones who would actually feed information of what's happening on the ground, the conditions on the ground, back to the emergency operations center. And then the operations, the persons at the EOC they will take the decision as to when to open and which shelters to open based on the resources they know that are available at those shelters. Because you don't want to go to a shelter that has no running water, no standby generator, mm -hmm. no lights. Okay? We continue to take your calls. Once again, you're watching Newsmaker Live right here on DBS Television. We're also on our Facebook page. My guest this evening is Mr. Kerwin Xavier, Communications Manager at NEMO. We have a call. Good evening, Gwadi, for contribution, caller. Hello. Good night, brother. Hi, good evening to you, caller. Um, Mr. Xavier, I have a question for you. Go, Go ahead, ahead, please. And it is a, also a concern. Go ahead. I live in the Ciceron area, mm -hmm. and I think you know that place, the Gulf. Beg your pardon? The Gulf. Yes, I do know the Gulf. There is an elderly lady living in the Gulf, and the house is actually over a precipice. Mm. And it is a war house. Now, I am afraid that if there is a storm, that house might go down. What will I do with that woman, a 92-year-old woman? Should I wait when, after the house has gone down, for me to take her from the house and put her in a shelter? What should I do? Okay, thank you so much. You can listen over the television set now. I thank you for thank this. You. I thank you very much for this um, concern and question. And this is what I speak of when I talk about responsibility. Because in a community, in fact, disaster preparedness is all about the whole community. 
each one taking care of each other and we take and those who are more able to take care of themselves and those who are unable to take care of themselves. So in a situation like that, my advice would be first and foremost, pass that information immediately to the people from the district disaster committee and they will know exactly how to contact whether it's NEMO Secretariat or the appropriate authorities because there is a protocol for dealing with that. But I want to thank the caller. And in fact, I want to encourage persons to do more, about, more of that. Taking responsibility for their own community and their own affairs. Good evening. News make live. You're on the air. Hi, hello. Good night. Hi, good night. Good evening to you, ma'am. In terms of travel, um, in it terms is, of what, ma'am? Are you all advising that um, persons travel, given that by this time the weather would have progressed to normal? When you say traveling, meaning traversing on the streets and vehicles and so on? No. Fl flying. Or going okay. traveling overseas? Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you so much for calling. Correct. The all the airlines, and in fact today that was actually revealed to us, all the airlines, whether it's Liat, whether it's British Airways, they determine basically which conditions are safe for their planes and their pilots to operate. And what they would do, they would actually send that information to SLASPA or directly to the media and that information will be disseminated. As last minute, it will also determine whether the when airports will function. Or, yeah. Correct. We have so, a call. Right. Good evening. This is Newsmaker Live. You're on the air. Yes, Mr. Sassi, I'm calling back again. Yes. Mm -hmm. I am a member of the Disaster Preparedness Committee, Sassi South. Right. But I cannot take out that lady from her house until I get the claim to open a shelter. And to me, that's a disaster. No. Have you conversed with the chairperson of that committee? Have you spoken to the chairperson of that disaster committee? Well, the chairperson of the committee cannot do anything about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. My my advice to you, caller. Okay, First of all, is Thank to you. no no is to use mm -hmm. is to use the protocol. And if you say you're a member of the disaster committee, you know ex you know what that protocol is. Basically, what happens? and this is NEMO on the whole, the District Disaster Committee really and truly represents NEMO. It's a small version of NEMO with almost the same sort of positions. And really and truly, they should try to deal with it within the authority. If they cannot deal with it within their own authority and within their own capacity, then they refer the matter back to the NEMO Secretariat and then we find the resources necessary to assist them. I think because we have in that case, mm -hmm. you'll also have people, and they're aware of that, that you have people like the fire service, who we could pass the information on, who will, be, who will help. We have a call. Good evening. Hi, good evening. Hi, good evening to you, sir. How are you too? I'm all right. How about you? Well, okay, holding on. Yes, yeah, it's, uh, it's, well, since we... In Is that the Mr. House Anthony Avril? Yes, good evening, Mr. Yes. Okay, good evening, Mr. Avril, yeah. Yes. Yeah, since we're in the hurricane season, I, I, I find that it's a very interesting program. Um, I, have been, I have been listening and hearing a lot of concerns, a lot of questions being asked. Um, we, we, we claim that um, we, are, we are Christian nation and, and we pray a lot. And most of the time, God hears our prayer and being spared, spared us. But it's something, something I heard um, Mr. Avril mention a while ago that really triggered me to call. Um, he he pointed out that um, the the shelter the, the, the shelters, unless there is somebody to receive you, that you're not supposed to go to the shelter. I could tell you a very fast story. I was in Cuba. I was in Cuba some time back, and a hurricane was announced. Mm -hmm. And we were living in a hotel um, near the seashore. Mm -hmm. Automatically, the government moved in and take out everybody from that hotel and put us more inland, where 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 they anticipated that the hurricane won't pass. But I cannot understand. Um, we are hearing in 2018. We are hearing 
in terms of a hurricane, um, people, citizens, have to more or less take care of their own safety. We don't have, we don't have proper shelter. And you're telling me in a disaster of a hurricane that, you know, it's after, after the storm, after the storm pass, that you could tell me a shelter will be open for people to, to, to go to the shelter, Timothy? I don't think that can be accepted at this time, uh, you know, 2018. Uh, I, I, I'm not. I'm, I'm not happy. I'm not happy to hear that um, for, for my country, for my government. Okay, thanks That's a lot. Okay, well, and by the way, by the way, I got it wrong. Yeah, was that was not Mr. Mr. Andrew. No. Andrew. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. But is there merit in what he's saying? Well, there, there is merit. The what we need to do, and these contributions are wonderful. Mm -hmm. We have to ask ourselves in our development of this country whether we are really ready to pay taxes in order to get serious hurricane shelters. And we know our country, most persons are not even willing to pay taxes. So we need to change our whole thinking if we are to develop. We go to places, we see the services they have, and we want the services here. But we don't talk about what are the sacrifices they make in order to receive those services? Some of the sacrifices they make is paying taxes. In this country, any government that comes up and says, okay, I'm going to increase taxes so that we could have X, Y, and Z services, what do we do? So we need to ask ourselves some serious questions in this country, whether we are willing together to build this country and make the necessary sacrifices to have the services we believe are the best services. And I do agree with the caller that something we should now look to get in some primary hurricane shelters, but the reality is currently we don't. We have a call. Hello, good evening, you on the air? Yes, good night to you, Tim. Hi. Good night to your guest. Good evening to you, sir. Yeah. Um, how, how is your community? <laughs> well, we cool there for now. We're just having some strong winds. Oh, okay. excellent. Yeah, yeah but cool. nothing really. It's calling from, from Denry. Yeah. Okay, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I recognize the caller. One yeah. of your... F yes. Um, yeah. Tim, mm -hmm. you see, um, normally what I know happens, eh, um, each district normally has its um, disaster preparedness committee. Correct. And there are people that are designated, you know, for, to, to carry out different tasks. <laughs> you understand? During, during a storm or during a hurricane. During, Correct. You understand? So there would be somebody designated, you know, for different shelters. That person, as far as I know, because I served on the Denver Disaster Preparedness Committee for a number of years. You understand? And that would be that person's responsibility to open that shelter. There are primary shelters and secondary shelters. Shelters, the primary shelters are shelters you go to during the storm, and the secondary shelters are mostly for after the storm or after the hurricane. So people would be designated to open these shelters. So everybody, especially the lady that she's talking about, Tim, who's supposed to um, be taken out of her house, they're supposed to be people, you know, they're supposed to have a list of people, especially <laughs> people who are disabled and so on, that they have to go to to get them out of their homes, you know, whenever the um, uh, weather system is approaching. So they're supposed to be people who are de designated for these purposes. So it's not, it should not be left up to her. They should have other people you know, who should come to assist her if she needs assistance, you know, to get that lady out of her house. You know, that's how I know it operates. I mean, the disaster preparedness committees take responsibility, you know, for the communities. You can't expect Nemo to come, I mean, to Cicero or to wherever you live, you know, to come and get somebody out of her house. You understand? That is their responsibility. People um, 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 use their vehicles, you know, they have vehicles assigned to different people. I know that the, the Ministry of Communications and Works would, would give us tools, would give us vehicles and so on, so that we could move around with. You know, so that's how I know it operates. So I, that's how, in fact, it should operate. That's how they should go about doing it. So let them designate people to do this task, Tim, and I think um, everything would work out smoothly. Well, Thank you so much, okay. Colin. Well, you're certainly correct about that. As I, as, I, as I indicated before, the DDCs are exactly a smaller version of NEMO, mm -hmm. and they would have capabilities, and they would have resources assigned to them. And if in case they are unable to deal with whatever the incident is on the ground, then what they will do, they'll ask for backup or they ask for assistance from from the secretariat or the wider NEMO. Good evening. Go ahead with your contribution, caller. 
Hi, Timothy. Hi, good evening to you, Hi, sir. Hi, Timothy. I'm listening to you all there. And, of course, I I applaud Mr. Xavier for um, presenting himself in the manner in which he should, and he is. But, you know, I'm listening to this thing with these people calling, and they talk about, you know, you should try and get, or is Nemo going to try and get some 92-year-old person that lives in a wall house over a cliff? You know, you know, so many times, We've been trying to get people to get out of certain areas as a result of bad weather coming. And, you know, these people obviously would, would resist, you know. For instance, um, we can go back to, to the vagrants on the street, you know, during the, the, the flood times and whatnot. And when they try to get them out, you would hear the, the uh, what's, it, what's it, human rights lawyer coming out and say that the people democratic rights and all this kind of thing, you know. So at what point... at what force we would have to approach these people with. I listened to a gentleman called and talk about, um, you know, a hurricane that was in Cuba and he was at a hotel and the force of the Cuban government had them to get out. You know, it is a communism uh, um, um, act. But, you know, in our democratic country, you cannot force the people out. You, you see what I'm saying? You know, according to you, Timothy, I heard you, you spoke about, isn't it, couldn't it be mandatory? Mandatory is the same way. When you try to make it that way, the human rights come out and say it's the people's rights and all this kind of thing. You know, so I figure you'll have to look at how you can um, deal with situations like that. Otherwise, thank you so much, thank Colin. You. I appreciate the contribution. There's an issue as well with um, unplanned planning and um, developments or unplanned developments because I find it a little strange that a house would be um, constructed over a precipice. It's, it's, it's very strange. Um, but nonetheless, I think every effort should be made to ensure that this lady is safe. I, I, the caller said that she's about 92. Certainly. Mm -hmm. I think um, the, um, the human aspect must override everything else. Yeah. I certainly believe that. But you have brought up a very um, important point. We have the experts here to guide us. And so you have the DC where you bring in your plans and they look over the plans and they say, okay, in order to protect you or to get your building that could withstand 150 miles per hour winds and this is what you ought to do and yet still what do we do we take the plans that have been approved and we do not build it mm -hmm. to the specs that have been recommended or the specs that have been approved so what we are doing in effect is placing ourselves at greater danger in St. Lucia as well because there is an absence of a land use policy people just build places that are just not suitable for housing in flood plains and the worst part is you have persons who have lived in those areas for about 30 40 years for generations they know the issues but yet still they put themselves in harm's way by actually going and building those places so again we need to look at ourselves as solutions and ask ourselves really and truly, what are we doing? And our first responsibility is to listen and take the advice of those experts. And maybe if we do that, then we could lessen the impact of some of those hazards on us. Let's take a break. You're watching News Make Alive. Once again, my guest this evening is Mr. Cohen Xavier, Communications Manager of the National Emergency Management Organization. Back in just a moment.
Welcome back. Thank you so much for staying with us. We continue to take your calls. You're watching Newsmaker Live. And my guest this evening is Mr. Kerwin Xavier, Communications Manager of the National Emergency Management Organization. St. Lucia, once again, has been placed on a tropical storm warning. We have been told that we should be feeling the first effects of that storm by midday tomorrow. And uh, the really intense aspect of that storm will be felt during the evening that's thursday and schools have been closed they will not be opening tomorrow and also on friday the decision was taken at a meeting of nemac today that's a pre-strike meeting and mr Cohen xavier will do us the honors again just to um reiterate the what came out of that nemac meeting today okay. well as you said and i'm just going to reiterate that one the schools will be closed tomorrow Thursday the 27th and also on Friday 28th of September. However, all principals and teachers are asked to report to their respective schools at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning so that they could activate the continuity of operation plans. Secondly, the business community, they all have what is called business continuity plans and they will activate that according to the internal protocols. So it means that persons are to go to work as per usual tomorrow morning and allow their business places and their plans to dictate what time they leave or whatever or, or what should happen throughout the day. Well, then we got a call from again. Somebody was um, making inquiries as to where the, the shelter located. I'd, I'd want to focus on this in just a moment because I, I think um, it, it's we lost that call. The call is yeah. coming in. It's very instructive. Yeah. Um, do you believe that there's need for more public education on the part of Nemo to inform people of where their shelters are located? Although, again, an effort was made by the organization about two months ago. Certainly. Tim, as I and I have been saying, and I think we could do a much better job if our partners understand they too have a role. Who are our partners? Our partners are the media people. And I could tell you, I send information to them on a regular basis. Do they take it? Do they read it? No. But when as soon as a crisis approaches or hazard approaches, they come back asking me that very information. So we all need to play our part if St. Lucia is to withstand any impact. So for instance, the information I sent out this morning to all media persons about the disaster preparedness tips, I first sent that out on the 2nd of June. Did they receive it? Maybe some did. Have they passed on that information to their guests or to their listeners, the audience? Their listeners, the audience? No. Well, that point. We have a call. News Nicolai, you on the air? Yes, Tim. I, Good evening. I heard the communications manager speak about the businesses activating the business protocol or own protocols. I think we, we have reached a, a, a time in our history where we need to protect employees. I remember, um, was it last year or a couple of years back, I can't remember, where the all clear was not given. On a particular gas station, I mean, imagine that, Tim, stormy conditions. And a particular station had not closed as yet. And the staff was still there. And, you know, it just was common sense at the time that the manager should have allowed those people to go home. Some of them probably living as far, so far away from the place of work. You know, but because of fear, the victimization, they didn't want to lose their job, they stayed on, even when it, the order was given that business places be closed. So I think in just leaving it up to managers and bosses when it comes to employees, I don't think it's right. We need to have probably something in, interested in the law until that day, Tim, that we have a serious incident, you know, where someone, an employee is losing their life because a boss refuses to understand that they need to put the employees first before making a few extra dollars, before after a, a, a major um, um, disaster. 
Thank you. All right, thank you so much. I remember either last year or year before, there was also a big debate in Barbados um, when the government decided that uh, business operations would be closed or should be closed. Even a government minister with um, a supermarket decided to open his business. We have a call. Good evening, you're on the air. Hi, good evening, Tim. Hi, good evening to you, ma'am. So my query is, when Nemo sends out the things out to us, what happens is they say the school is probably closed and the parents are still at work. It's kind of difficult for us to have the kids be dismissed from school and you are at work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it poses a problem for us. So I'm wondering, is it possible that when they're saying school is closed, can it not pass on the same thing to the business places? Because we are at work until like eight hours and we are waiting half day to have the government saying, oh, Nimua said, let's close for half day. But by that time, your children are at home. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. You're welcome. Yeah, what happens when, for example, you say classes will be closed tomorrow and on Friday, and yet still people have to report to work? In some cases, um, a, a single parent. Right. But you have to remember one of two things. When you take decisions, you have to be very comprehensive in the decisions that you take. Schools and children, they are among the most vulnerable of our community. Whereas adults might be able to fend, mm -hmm. even in a 10 mile per hour wind or 20 mile per hour, it is not the same for children. And so what the schools are doing, what the ministry and what the government is doing, out of an abundance of precaution, they're saying, look, it is better to have the children stay home than to have the children come into school and by 11 o'clock, you have parents having to leave their work to go and look for the children. So in order to avoid all of that chaos, leave the children home where they're safe and so that the parents could go to work, carry out their business continuity plans because each business should have that and this staff itself, the parents should be part of the planning and they should know what those plans are and let them execute it. We have our final call on nine. Good evening, you're on the air. Yes, good night. Hi, good evening to you, ma'am. I'm happy to be the final caller and this <laughs> the opportunity. Yes. And tonight, Mr. Xavier, is very interesting discourse and I'm good very happy you have him on. Mm -hmm. But okay. I would just like to find out, when mm -hmm. we say schools, like, um, usually includes preschools, but that, does that include also daycares? Can I have a response, please? Good night. Thank you so much Thank for calling. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. All schools. Imagine private, it, private, private schools. public schools, mm -hmm. all schools, because imagine, so... Let's, let's think about that. If, I'm going, if the government is going to say, or if the ministry is going to say, let's close primary schools. So you're talking about children from the age of 5 to 12 or 13 mm. and secondary schools, which are uh, even about older. Five, five, about 5 to 11. Right. Mm -hmm. And secondary schools, which are from about 13 to 16, 17. Mm. You tell me they're going to close schools for so all those wonderful people. And what's about the younger ones who are from three months yeah. up they'll mm -hmm. send them to school i don't think that so let me clarify i thank you for the question so let me clarify it's for all schools every single school so daycare preschool toddlers mm -hmm. infant school primary school secondary school tertiary organizations so that's AFA as well all schools so i hope that clarifies the, qu the situation. It's all schools. Final comments from you, Mr. Xavier? Right. In order for St. Lucia to survive any incidents or any disaster, we all need to play our respective roles. And as citizens, our first responsibility is for our own, the protection of our life and property. And in order to help our country recover quickly, we need to build resilience and we need to build capacity. The only way you could do that is to plan so that you could lessen the impact of a hazard on, your, on you and on your property. And so I encourage everybody to adopt from this day onwards a perpetual preparation mood, a per perpetual preparedness um, attitude sit with your family 
do a family emergency plan. And a family emergency plan is a very simple plan. What it does, it takes all of the hazards that we are in St. Lucia, or the common hazards, and it divides it into phases. So phase one, which is before what are the activities that happen before, during a phase of warning, during the hurricane or the storm, and after. But not only just dividing it, but assigning specific tasks or specific responsibilities to each member of our family. If we do those things, then we might be better able to withstand any hazard that comes our way. Mr. Cohen Xavier, thank you so much for being my guest on this evening's Newsmaker Live and again appearing at very short notice. <laughs> yes. And to you, okay. thank you so much for watching the broadcast and thank you so much for contributing via your calls. If it's Wednesday, it's Newsmaker Live. Time now for the clip that peaked. <laughs> Once again, that's broadcast. Thank you so much for watching. My name is Timothy Paulion saying good night, be safe, and see you next time.